So today we're in Acts chapter 16, and if you follow along with the calendar really strictly, you'll know that this is like a little bit of a divergence from what we've done over the last couple of years. We're technically in summer, and we've not begun summer psalms. That'll begin next week. Uh, and so what I thought, though, is that we'd wrap up uh, today by looking at a story in Acts chapter 16 about a specific person whose life was changed because he came to faith in Jesus. And that's really what we've been doing over this last uh, month, these last three, four weeks now, including today, is looking at various people who were confronted with the gospel, uh, various people for whom Jesus showed up in a way that changed their lives. And uh, we've looked now up to this point, I'm not gonna test you today, don't worry, at three different people. I did that last week, I guess that's enough for one, like one year. Uh, <laughs> Cornelius, week one, taught us that God calls us to life transformation, to be transformed, and that being transformed, that learning to live into the way of Jesus, learning to live the life that Jesus calls us into is a process. It takes time. It's got to be worked out over a long haul, and actually for each one of us, there's something that God is continuing to call us to lay down and to allow God to, to change, whether we've been doing this thing, church, God, Jesus, you know, f for our entire lifetime, or whether we're brand new to faith, like this is something that God calls each of us to. So, uh, second week, <clears throat> excuse me, Lydia taught us that God is leading the charge, right? God's leading the process. It's, it's God's intervention. Uh, and so in that story, God very specifically leads Paul to that moment where he met with Lydia and where Lydia uh, is, uh, becomes a follower of Jesus. <clears throat> we also talked a little bit that week about how we as followers of Jesus, if you call yourself a Christian, can position ourselves. There are things we can do that uh, maybe uh, allow ourselves to be ready for God to show up. We talked about how she's this person of prayer. She goes and she prays and she worships. And that that was part of her life, even ahead of God showing up in the way that God did. And so for those of us, we can continue to kind of prepare our hearts and our minds for God to show up. Week three, Simon, we looked at salvation. Uh, we looked at uh, God's gift. Uh, God's spirit is a free gift, not to be purchased or wielded for personal gain. So that's kind of the moment that we looked at in Simon's life. So Simon, he's called a sorcerer, and he becomes a follower of Jesus, and then he sees everybody living and acting and giving the spirit, the gift of God's presence. And so he says, hey, let me purchase it. And, uh, you know, he's, he's strongly rebuked at that point that it's not something that we can control. It's not something we can purchase. It's not something meant to just be exchanged like that. This is a free gift that God offers. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look at, again, in kind of our theme of looking at maybe the lesser known moments of people coming to faith in Jesus. In Acts chapter 16, looking at uh, Paul, and, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul and Silas in prison and the story of the jailer who comes to faith in Jesus. It gives us a unique opportunity, I think, at the, at the end, just kind of to wrap this all up. But look at a word that I think is, is important. It's crucial, really and that the New Testament is filled with, and that maybe church language has been filled with for a long time, and that word is believe. What does it mean to believe? Uh, let me ask you a question, and I do want answers to this one. How many of you have seen the TV show Ted Lasso? Yeah, hands up, come on, that's okay. I've watched all three seasons of it, painfully at times. It's very good, and then it's very bad, and then it's very good again, and then it ends. So I'm like, okay, at least it ended in the right way. Uh, Ted Lasso, it's the very, very fake, not even remotely based in reality TV show about an American football coach who finds himself coaching a Premier League football team overseas in England. And I know you know this, but those are not even remo like remotely the same sport, <laughs> right? I don't need to tell you that. Uh, and so the, the three seasons of it, again, uh, some of it's worth watching, some of it's not worth watching. Uh, but at some point in the first season, this coach goes up and in his, you know, in his working with this team, he writes one word on a piece of paper and then he posts it up on the wall in their dressing room. And that one word is believe believe. And it's as if he's saying to the team, like, listen, like, all you need to do is believe. All you need to do is believe. All you need is to have faith. And that becomes the mantra. Like, that becomes, like, their word for the entire three seasons is that they just need to believe. And I go, okay, you're leaving a little bit out here. Like, believe 
where? Believe in who? Right? Believe in yourself. And so it's, it's great. It's a feel-good story. But I wonder if we've taken up, uh, maybe in some ways, in the church, the same mantra around this word believe. Believe. Just believe. All you need to do is believe. All you need to do is have faith. All you need to do is just trust, just have a little bit of faith, and all you need is to believe. How many of you have heard that type of response to something like in your life in the church? And I don't need hands on this one, okay? But maybe you're going through like a, like a difficult season of life, and you're like, man, this is complicated. Uh, because for sure, like this is like a spiritual issue and thing that like, I'm wrestling with. Maybe I'm wrestling with doubt. Maybe, maybe I'm going through seasons where like I've got some big questions about who God is and who I am and like the creation of the world. And we do this with kids all the time. And sometimes we go and we say, hey, just, just believe. Just have faith. And I think for me, like, you can file those things along in a way with, with other lines that are theologically correct. We've talked about this idea before. The lines that are theologically correct, but not always as helpful as we'd like. Not always as helpful in moments where like life is hard and difficult. And somebody shows up and they're like, hey, just have some faith. And you're like, I got faith. I'm trying. How many of you maybe had this scripture quoted at you, right? Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Great, great scripture. But I think sometimes what happens is we take that verse and we think that the writer of Hebrews is trying to define what is required in order to have faith. Faith requires assurance. Faith requires a certainty, right? Requires these things. It requires for you to know when the reality is that he's simply telling us what the substance of faith actually is. He says it's the substance of what we hope for. It's assurance of these things that we do not see, but it is what we hope for. The reality, I think, is that every single one of us, when it comes down to it, lives a life, is living a life of faith. Where we place that faith is maybe one of the major things that distinguishes us one from another. So we meet the jailer. Uh, you're not going to be surprised by this. In prison. Makes sense. Where else would you meet a jailer? But what has happened so far is that Paul has shown up. He's in Philippi at this point, and he's preaching the gospel. People are becoming followers of Jesus. And there's a, a woman who's, uh, who's unwell. And the Bible says she's sick, and she's got an unclean spirit. That's how she's described. And, and so she's calling out and kind of following Paul. And Paul's preaching, and they're teaching, they're moving through Philippi. And, and he, he finally, like, he, he gets to this point where he's, he's actually, like, so frustrated that he just, he turns and he rebukes this woman, and she's healed. And, and then the person who actually owned, we find out who owned this woman, who was profiting, who was making money off the work that she was doing, gets upset because now he's no longer got a way to make money. And so Paul and Silas are drug out and they're beaten and they're thrown in prison. And then we pick up the story. So 16, Acts 16, I'm going to start at 22 and read down to about, <clears throat> excuse me, 28 or so. So it says, the crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas. So they've been drug out at this point. And the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. We're going to return to that point at the very end. Uh, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up. When he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword. He was about to kill himself because he didn't think the prisoners, or because he had thought, rather, excuse me, the prisoners had escaped. What ends up happening then is, is that Paul shouts out, we'll end here for now, don't harm yourself, we are all here. 
So middle of the night, earthquake hits. The jail is kind of in ruins. The foundation is shook. The, the chains come off of Paul and Silas and the other prisoners. And, and then into the darkness, Paul shouts, hey, don't harm yourself. We are all here. This, I think, is a story. It's a tale of two salvations. It's a story about two moments of salvation, of, of two moments of, of saving that happens in, in the life of the jailer. I wonder if you've ever lived through a moment where you realize that everything in your life has changed, like because of something that is in control, or you are in control of, or because of something that is completely outside of your control. Uh, like every single thing you realize in this moment, something significant has shifted. I'm guessing you have. Perhaps it was a midlife crisis. Or a quarter-life crisis, because I've been told that those are now things to be worried about, right? Some sort of existential, why am I here and what am I doing level question that kind of rattles you to the core. Um, many of us may be honest enough, maybe not honest enough, brave enough to answer whether we've lived or are living through that type of moment in our lives. Uh, maybe it was when you were married. You realize that something significant has shifted here, something has changed, and it now it, it kind of redefines everything about my life and everything in the future. Uh, maybe it was the birth of a child. I remember the birth of our first kid. I was like, okay, everything has changed. Wow, life is never gonna be the same again. And then the birth of my second kid, and I'm like, okay, great, everything has changed again. Never, never, is good. it's never gonna be one, and now we're looking forward to three, and this is what people keep telling me. Uh, you're gonna be outnumbered, and I'm like, thanks. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> There's another thing to be worried about. This is something, right? Something shifts. My uncle was sent to the car dealership with marching orders to purchase their first minivan. He came home with a Mustang. <laughs> yeah, something changed. <laughs> nah, they're still married. It's great. All three, yeah, anyways. Maybe it was a moment in your life, though, that was a little less positive. Certainly, the pandemic has felt like that. I think for many people, you look back and you go, yeah, okay, something changed there. Maybe, though, it was like the death of a friend or a family member. Not quite sure how you're going to move forward or what does moving forward even look like. And something, again, something has shifted. Something stops you in your tracks, and you feel like your life is never going to be the same again. The story of the jailer coming to faith in Jesus is one of those moments. It is a moment where he is brought to, um, like literally a second, a thought in his mind and his life where he realizes that things for him, because of what has just happened, uh, things are never going to be the same again. So Paul and Silas, they're put into the inner cell of the prison, feet mounted into stocks. There's, they, they're locked up. They begin to worship. Uh, all the prisoners are listening. The, the jailer, it says he's asleep, so obviously at some point he goes to bed. At night, there's an earthquake, and the prison doors open, and the shackles fall off the prisoners. And, and by all accounts, we have like all of the prisoners, every single one of them who was there at the same time, not just Paul and Silas. And then the guard wakes up to find that moment. And in that moment, whether he likes it or not, everything in his life has changed. Now, if there would be a prison break today, and I'm sure there are, and maybe, you know, recently, I don't know, um, depending on the severity and the circumstances, what would happen, right? Maybe the whole world would watch. Maybe. Maybe news outlets would pick it up, depending on how big the scale was. Maybe your social media would be, like, inundated with opinions about what happened, and uh, maybe a few people at the end of the day might lose their jobs. Uh, Fox would turn it into a TV show that lasted far too long. In the Roman world... That wasn't the case. Obviously, that wasn't the case. In the Roman world, a guard who was responsible for a prisoner who had escaped would himself be required to suffer the punishment that that prisoner was due. Whatever that prisoner had done, whatever uh, trial they had been put on, whatever judgment they had faced, whatever punishment they were facing, the guard who let that prisoner go would have to suffer those consequences. Uh, flogging equals flogged. Beating equals beaten, killed equals, or killed equals killed. That's it, dead equals dead. Like, that's the punishment. That's the level of responsibility that the guards had. By all accounts, this guard, in his mind, was now facing whatever punishment every single one of those prisoners were facing, all of them, he was now facing. Because he was responsible, quote, responsible, right, for their escape. In their understanding, in their economy, this guard had let that happen. And there's a moment of despair, and there's a moment of panic, 
and there's a moment of sorrow or regret, whatever it is that takes place, like in this jailer's mind, he, he takes his sword out and he is preparing to kill himself. That's what we read. And it's at that moment that Paul and Silas shout out from the chaos, essentially like this, like just stop, don't do it. We're still here. Like, you're gonna be okay. We haven't left, you are safe. This is the message that, that is relayed to the jailer in those moments. And it's the first salvation that happens. It's the first saved life in the story. The jailer was dead. But Paul and Silas had given him a new chance for life. It's as if Paul and Silas knew. They themselves, or Paul, Roman citizen, knew. Hey, if we leave, this guy's a goner. Like, if we flee, like, that's it. His life's over, so maybe we'll stay. And I don't know, like, that's not in the scripture, but I'm wondering, right? You wonder if those are the thoughts that go through somebody's mind in those moments. And Paul's chains are off. The jail's in rubble. The foundation has been shaken, shook, like, to its core. The guard is caught off, off guard, literally. <laughs> He's asleep. And Paul and Silas, they choose the life of this man over their own lives, over their own freedom. They choose to stay. We'll stay whatever the punishment, so that this man can live. And it's a great exchange that happens. So the jailer, what happens in 29? The jailer, if we continue reading, calls for the lights. He rushed in and he fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Uh, then he brought them out and he asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You're thinking, hey, buddy, like you're already safe. But he gets it. His question, it comes immediately, directly out of his realization that these men have quite literally already saved his life and that maybe, just maybe, their actions had something to do with who they were, that there was something different in them, that there was something different about the way they chose to live their lives that allowed for him to keep his. Across history, we've seen this. We've seen this question play out generation after generation. What must I do to be saved? It's a question that we pose over and over again in many different ways, different language. And maybe you've asked it in terms of a relationship to God in a very real and personal way. What must I do to be saved? Or what must happen in order for me to be saved? And maybe you've wrestled with that question already. But maybe there's a chance you've asked it in different ways. One of the thoughts that uh, Carl Jung left with humanity before he died was this observation, and it's not rocket science, I'm sorry, but anyways, uh, but it's, it's, I, think, I think it's poignant. We see this observation that humanity is constantly searching for meaning, that life is this perpetual searching for something that matters. And that one of the things, and we've talked again about this in sermons, we've, they've studied, there have been nurses and then scientists who have done longer term research, but you ask any nurse, right, who works with somebody as they're dying, there are common regrets over and over that they, uh, we hear. People at moment or in the moments before they die, one of the biggest regrets is that they didn't allow themselves to live their life in a way that, that gave them meaning. So Jung, this is what he says. He says, as far as we can discern, which seems uh, a little fatalist, he says, as far as we can discern, the sole purpose of human existence is to kindle a light in the darkness of mere being. As if he's trying to say, listen, like, don't merely be. We don't want to live a life that just was and then wasn't. Try to do something that generates a little bit of life, a little bit of meaning a little bit of light in the midst of just simply existing. And I think we all do it. We all live our life. We try to figure something out and find something out that, that matters, that has meaning. And so maybe you haven't asked the question like in these exact words, but maybe you've asked like, what does give my life meaning? What will give it meaning? I think it's a question that many of us wrestle with. And we've, again, we've talked about this. We ask kids, like, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? We put this tremendous amount of pressure on them, but really what we're asking is, like, like what do you hope for in life? What do you want to be? What do you want to become? Like, what do you want your life to point toward? Why am I here? What, what is the point of all of this? What do I need to do in this life to be happy? All questions of searching for meaning, searching for something beyond ourselves, right? searching for something that, 
that brings this whole thing together in a way that makes sense, hopefully makes sense. My hope in, in looking at each of these stories and, and all of them together, if you've been around for all four weeks, my hope is that each one of us would allow ourselves to be confronted with this question, like, what must I do to be saved? What is there in my life that God wants to get a hold of? Like, if you've been in the church for 92 years, don't let this pass you by. It's still a moment to say, hey, what is God trying to get a hold of and change in my life? Where do I need God's life to actually change the way I'm living mine? What must I do to be saved? I love the way Paul answers. Paul, Paul's answer, uh, so many questions in Scripture do this. Jesus was, I think, the, the master at doing this. Takes the question and, and just really simplifies it and even, like, flips it in on himself. He says this. So uh, they <clears throat> reply, excuse me, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's it. You and your household. And then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. I love that in, in his immediate reply, so it says that he, he, they, tell them, they tell him about Jesus, for sure. But I love that in his immediate reply, like Paul doesn't preach this sermon. He, he doesn't give a lecture. Like he doesn't go in deep into theology. I'm sorry, theologians in my life. Like he's not judgmental. He's not vindictive. He doesn't bring up in the jail, well, hey, like, jailer, like, first of all, let's list everything you've ever done that's so horrible about your life. You don't want to rehash it. You know what? Let's talk about that. He doesn't say, but it's like, hey, uh, what are all of the sins that you need to uh, repent of? And he says, listen, hey, you need to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He simply points the jailer to Jesus. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. And then they, he tells them a story about Jesus' life, who he was, about his death and about his resurrection. That's the implication here. There are a few things that I really hope that we hear and that we see in, in these lines of Scripture. First, will be saved. The language all the way through, because you can get hung up on this, what must I do? You can get hung up on that. What must I do to earn the salvation of God? That's, that's not what we're talking about. The language is be saved, and I think it's intentional. Paul's language reminds us that salvation is something God offers to humanity. It's not an intellectual ascent that eventually you attain to. Perfect, I've figured it all out, therefore I am saved. It's also not a spiritual ascent. I've learned the practices. I've done the things. Right? It's not the, like, my habits towards spirituality are the best habits that I could possibly, uh, you know, do, and I'm staying on with all of them. Like, every single morning I get out, those are good things, but that's not what Paul's saying. He doesn't say, hey, develop, or cultivate a life that, that, that has spiritual habits or a life that attains knowledge. Paul doesn't say, memorize these verses or learn this principle. He doesn't say, study these theologians. And I'm just like, okay, come on, I love studying theologians. Uh, he says, salvation for the follower of Jesus means that you are delivered from death to life, not by your own actions, but because of the actions of Jesus. To be saved literally means to be delivered out of danger and into safety. Out of death and into life. Second, I don't think that believe, belief or, or this, this call to believe refers to a feeling or to an emotion, but to an action. A better way uh, to understand this language that Paul is using is simply to say this. Paul says, trust in the Lord Jesus. Trust in Jesus as Lord. Lord is a title. We're going to talk about that in a second. What Paul says specifically is, choose to trust that Jesus is Lord. It's not a feeling. You might feel it at times. You might not feel it at times. It's not an emotion. You might feel more emotionally connected at times. You might feel emotionally disconnected at times. But I think we get caught up that we say, well, I don't feel it. I don't believe. I don't have that feeling in my, in my life. I've not received faith. Like, I had this Greek professor who over and over again, like, to the point where I was like, I'm banging my head on the desk, and now I love it. He says, you never translate. This is like a nerdy thing to say. Oh, my goodness, in a sermon. That's okay. I love it. He says, never translate faith, have faith. He says, no, faith, duh. There's a line where, where it says, like, Abraham 
had faith in Jesus. You know, no, Abraham faith. Abraham chose to trust, and it was credited, credited to him as, as righteousness. It, it's this action that you are called into, and you don't have to do it perfectly. And you don't have to feel it perfectly. But we're challenged, each one of us, to choose to trust that Jesus is Lord. When the jailer comes to Paul and Silas in the night, with his question, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He's actually saying to them specifically, he says the same word, lords, lords, what must I do to be saved? And Paul turns it around, he says, no, actually, the thing you need to do to be saved is, is to choose to trust that Jesus is the Lord, the only one. That word Lord was used a lot in the Roman world. There were many lords, many sirs, and I think what Paul challenges the jailer to see is that, listen, like you may use this word one way, but actually God intends that there is one Lord. There's one Savior. There's one Deliverer. There's one Rescuer. There's one Messiah. You, you need to choose to trust that Jesus is that one person. So finally, I think, of what does it, <clears throat> excuse me, what does trust in Jesus give us or, or, or lead us to or point us to? And maybe this is for you if you've been around the church for a while. How do we live forward in, into faith? I think the, the choice to trust in Jesus as Lord is exactly what gives Paul and Silas the ability to give the gift of life to the jailer. Right? Choosing to trust in God for them was an action. Choosing to trust that Jesus was Lord led to a very specific thing. I think anyone involved in, in any relationship uh, that uh, involves trust, so think any relationship, any time with anyone ever, right, uh, knows that trust requires energy. Trust requires effort. It's not necessarily, right, it's not about a feeling that you may or may not have for, let's say, toward your spouse or your partner. What happens? Over time, you build up storehouses of trust by choosing to trust, and by also having that choice validated and reciprocated. It is, I believe, a, a choice that God empowers by the Holy Spirit, and it's one that God honors in your life, to name Jesus as Lord. And so I, I don't know exactly where every single one of you are in terms of your relationship to God. Like, you may be in the place of a jailer right now, of that jailer, and still needing to decide, or being led or invited to decide whether you will choose to trust Jesus ultimately as Lord of your life, whether you will believe in an even greater exchange that took place than Paul and Silas for the jailer, but actually Jesus' life for yours, his death in exchange for your life. Like, that might be the, the decision. And you may be invited, you may be being invited to accept and, and to embrace a new life because of what Christ offers. You may also be in a place in life where you're called to live simply like Paul and Silas did in that prison. They prayed, and they praised God in prison. And I think it's because their trust in Jesus as Lord enabled them to choose to praise and to worship regardless of the situation or the circumstance that they were in, in in life. It didn't change the reality that Jesus was Lord. It didn't change the reality of who God was and who God had created them to be. And what they're doing in that moment is simply continuing to point their lives and their hearts and their minds in that direction. They're saying, regardless of the moment that we're in, Jesus is still Lord, and we're going to choose to praise, we're going to choose to worship, we're going to choose to pray. And because of that, I think God enabled them to choose to exchange their lives for the jailer. And because of the love and, and the grace that they offered, that jailer got to know Jesus. And that jailer got to experience the, the love and the grace of Jesus. And God's love and God's grace is still on offer. That's the hope of the gospel, is that it's still there. And it's still there for you to know and to experience in your own life, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's also still there for you to pick up and live out of so that others can too. I love this line in scripture. Jesus says to his disciples, and so he sent them out. He said, hey, love this. Uh, go figure it out. <laughs> go try some of this out. And then he says, and always remember this, right? Freely you have received, so freely you can give. 
But trusting in Jesus as Lord leads to this moment where he says, hey, trust in Jesus. You will be saved. You and your household. Freely you have received. Freely give.